Well, a very good morning to you all and welcome to the AFI group webinar on MUP ground conditions and when to use them and when to use spreader pads. My name is Brian Parker and I'm the Business Development Manager, Technical Support for the AFI group of companies. The approximate running time of this webinar is 45 to 50 minutes and I hope to have a short question and answer session at the end. Now, if you do have any questions, um, please feel free to ask them during the webinar and I will do my utmost to uh, answer all the questions throughout the webinar. Um, those that I cannot answer, uh, I will answer after the webinar. Now, forgive me, I'm afford, unfortunately, I've got the, uh, the bout of man flu, so hopefully it's not going to distract too much from the experience today, um, but I will certainly do my best to um, you know, uh, keep going. Try not, to, uh, try not to fail you on this. Okay, so just a little bit about myself. Um, Basically, my background has been within plant for as long as I can remember it, uh, whether that's construction plant being from the X-Forces and uh, through to, you know, lifting and handling with cranes in various companies I've worked for. Um, for the last sort of 16, 17 years now, I've worked in powered access, um, of which I've then sort of uh, kind of been, I wouldn't necessarily say at the forefront, but probably, a, a you know, a pain in the proverbial when it comes to certain, um, you know, making sure standards and making sure you know uh, courses are the right for, for our clients so I've been a previous training committee member uh, and former chairman of that training committee um, and more latterly working on the strategic forum plant safety group um, which some of you will actually uh, no doubt be members of um, through various um, you know committees such as build UK which used to be the UKCG and also the HSC have a, a very uh, interest in there I've been a senior IPAF instructor now for 16 years, so uh, you know, kind of uh, sit myself in terms of uh, you know knowing as much as I need to know about powered access. So hopefully you're going to learn from something from today. Um, hopefully I'm not going to be too contentious. Um, I, I have got um, you know vested interest in terms of this ground conditions um, because you know we, we're seeing people unfortunately you know fatally injured. So uh, hopefully you can see what I'm trying to achieve here. Um, and uh, just to be aware that within the IPAF training fraternity, I'm also, I sit on the IPAF uh, UK Country Council as a, as a guest at the moment, I may add, but um, predominantly because I'm the, the working group chairman for the ground conditions document, which has been revised, hence, hence this webinar today. Okay, so just to look what we're going to look through today, um, we're going to look, th you know, introduce the, how we, how we got, what we've got today and then responsibilities. Um, we're going to look at some fatal incident data. It's relatively new information that's came out from uh, IPAF and hopefully you'll see some of the, um, you know, the, the issues that we need to address going forward. We're going to look at the current IPAF guidance for um, ground conditions and then uh, some varying definitions. Um, and then survey. This is where you're going to get your opportunity to get involved. Um, I'm really just sort of wanting to sort of see what your um, thoughts are on, on some devices a little bit later on. We're going to look through some mute definitions um, and then basically get down to sort of risks, management, um, hazards, etc. And then looking at wheels. Um, some of you may have been on the IPATH website and you've probably may even hopefully use the IPATH Ready Reckoner. Um, to get an idea of, uh, of you know, something to put underneath uh, a pad, not like my friend in the bottom picture there who uh, clearly didn't listen to that guidance that day. Um, but um, And hopefully uh, we can get a little bit more information out of you. Uh, and then a quick summary at the end with a, with a short question and answer session. But, you know, feel free to get involved. Also, you've got your opportunity at the end to just do a, a quick poll, a sh short survey on what you've thought. Um, would appreciate any feedback and um, you know maybe even if you maybe want to see a webinar in the future on a certain topic then that's maybe something if you if you feel that um, you know you, you would like to see something on that okay so failure of the ground obviously on which you know all construction plant uh, and, I, and I kind of you know I debated whether to say construction because you know unfortunately they do have uh, you know their, their share of incidents but I mean it's all plant you know whether it's you know fork trucks, whether it's cranes, whether it's excavators, um, you know, failure of the ground is a frequent cause. And these actually lead, as you're well aware, to minor incidents, near misses, um, some severe injuries and unfortunately fatalities. Um, now, these in, these um, incidents certainly have an impact on the lives of, of those who are involved. And as you're well aware, these events can lead to delays in you know construction, in building, you know, downtime from the HSC investigation. Um, commercial loss, business loss, um, not 
even taking into account things like unrecoverable management time, loss of reputation, you know, and the effect of future uh, workloads. But, you know, of course, to the people that's involved, their families, loved ones, etc. you know, and, and often when we look back at some of the incidents that's happened, you know, the, the irony is, you know, maybe just a little bit more thought and planning could have potentially um, prevented that. So we've got a picture there that we got put out. In fact, I got put that in the, um, I got that put in the IPAF training committee or got some probably sort of six years ago now because, you know, we were, we were sort of getting all excited about ground conditions and there been a spate of incidents. Um, and um, you know, ultimately that picture there, you know, we we we, we often, I had IPAF instructors say to me, don't set up on the manual cover, don't set up on the service. Yeah, but irrespective of that, you don't set up in line of another service because that's unfortunately the route and the line of the service. So probably telling you things you already know here, um, but you know, often a quick survey um, and looking at this can uh, can really help us out. So all mutes rely on the condition of the ground on which they stand for their stability. Okay, so you know, that's that's quite obvious. Um, now, mutes can either operate on either wheels or tracks. Uh, now, some require the use of a stabilizer or outrigger or a pad uh, to increase the supporting base. So effectively, some will extend um, and some will obviously use that stabilizer or outrigger to either lift level or stabilize it. Now, we're, there's a document that I'm working on at the moment, and collectively we've, we've discussed this. We're going to refer to this as the point of contact with the ground because you can have a, a truck mounted machine like you saw in the previous picture on eight wheels, okay, but very, very shortly he's going to put four, four uh, outriggers down and he's going to have a point of contact, which is four, four places. So stick with me on this and hopefully it'll make sense a wee bit later on. So my quest started on this uh, ground conditions. Uh, side of things was back in about 2006 2007 I was involved and still am involved in the IPAF training committee and at the time um, I was involved in a working group to try and get people who were operating both truck and track mounted moops to start using pads under the outriggers often they were sent out with them but unfortunately the operator uh, chose not to use them so at the time, as you would appreciate, you know, for these things, you know, and unfortunately in this world, we learn from mistakes. You know, at the time we had a number of overturns and some were fatal. Uh, and nearly on all of the occasions where we identified what, of what information was available at the time, the underlying cause was this lack of an additional support to spread that load under the outrigger. So hence where the spread the load campaign came from the, from the IPAF side of things. So, you know, it, it was heartbreaking. Even at the time back then, I can recall seeing outriggers, you know, that have been punched through various types of ground services, you know, with an overturned boom, um, you know, in the distance, it buried in some type of, you know, structure with tarpaulin around it. And, uh, you know, you know that, that the, the end result there. So the guidance, the initial guidance, which I'll cover later, um, was, was created. And again, I'll reiterate that this at the time was for boom type mupes which were supported on their outriggers and it's important that you you know I reference that here now because that's what it was for boom type mupes which are supported on their outriggers so it's important also to remind ourselves that there are other types of mupes out there and at the time we I don't know whether we were blinkered or, or whatever but we didn't really sort of have a huge um, concern with these other types of machines the training was going well um, you know people were getting trained high path cards were coming you know out thick and fast and there's you know 600,000 plus cards out there now so you know all that was going well but unfortunately we were still seeing these you know these truck mounted these track mounted machines turning over so the, these other various systems that can increase the supporting base um, we're often like outriggers and you've seen you know a crane set itself up you've seen a big truck you may have seen a big truck mount set itself up but equally you may also have um, other types of, uh, of uh, a supporting base. And this might not be so much common to you. Things like an extending axle, it's basically the same for a larger boom to allow it to extend to the heights of which it will go up to. Um, so effectively, we're making ourselves wider by extending our axles. Um, still four points of contact, I guess, in contact with the ground, uh, in point of contact with the ground. So, you know, we're not really losing anything there. Now, there are also some mutes out there which have devices which lift the machine clear of the ground, so commonly referred to as outriggers, or also jacks. Um, and you might have seen a, a scissor lift with a jack. Um, so now this, you know, these, these types of devices are to allow for items such, you know, I'm not going to list them all, but such as tyres and tyre pressures to come clear of the ground, because if you're going to get different pressures in tyres, 
you know, we, we might not be level. Um, but also to, to uh, take into account things like chassis flex. Um, so if the chassis needs, is flexing because we're, we're, we're not fully um, off the ground, it needs to be rigid, and that's what the, the outriggers are for. And then, of course, level the machine out. No machine should lift without the machine being level. Um, as uh, you know, tilt alarms, etc., should um, you know prevent that from happening. And of course, there are some MUPS that just have a device which level and stabilise a machine without increasing the overall width of the machine, which in this case would be uh, would, would would be a, a mobile vertical or a scissor lift. So, um, as we all know, the Health and Safety Work Act. You know, and a quick, I've got to do my health and safety bit. You know, we've got various regulations out there that require employers and self-employed people to ensure the safety of employees and others who are not in their employment, obviously including you know, members of the public. Part of that duty ensures the stability of MOOPs on site by assessing and managing the ground on which it stands. So I'm sure you've been you know, in your local city, you've seen a, a scissor lift or a, or a mobile vertical or a boom working alongside a, a footpath, you know, Harris fencing or you know, site hoarding. You know, that machine's working, it's quite capable of overturning and landing into a, a pedestrianised area or a public area of you know, vehicles. So they're the kind of things that we've got to be mindful of that. And also, in addition, you know, we have Section 6 of the Health and Safety Work Act, the supply of machinery regulations, which states that, you know, we have to uh, give information um, to our, um, you know, our, our customers. Um, and this will include, for, for obviously keeping it to the topic today, you know the weight of the machine and, and the loads imposed on the machine um, on the ground in all possible configurations uh, and I'll we'll just we'll go through that possible configurations a wee bit later on so some fatal incident data then so overturns um, so as you can see on the slide there um, we, we've got um, you know quite um, quite a sufficient number of incidents with overturns and if you can see the 2013 uh, 2014 if I just zoom in a wee bit more you can see we had 2013 we had 16 overturns and 2014 we had 17 overturns a total of 33 so we're not that far away from the biggest issue in MUPS and uh, for, for fatals which is falls from height now I would stress that this data is a worldwide data um, so IPAF have been very success uh, been very successful with their uh, MUP accident reporting system this was introduced by the IPAF UK Country Council to capture incidents and accidents which were happening predominantly in the UK. Um, alongside that, IPAF's technical officer, a guy called Chris Wraith, who I know very well, has been trawling through worldwide fatal data um, for evidence uh, of, you know, throughout the world. Um, and our Chris will stress, you know, even looking at these incidents here, he has no way of ascertaining, you know, if the persons using the mutes were trained. Uh, to use them and if they've been familiarized on the certain devices there so you know that in itself is another challenge and, and, and that's one you know that will certainly keep going now the graph shows the incidents which have either been reported to IPAF or IPAF have found out you know we're trawling the media etc now clearly the biggest cause of fatals still remains this fall from height but you know you can look at that not surprisingly um, we've got you know um, overturning not far behind the falls from height so again one of my reasons for asking IPAF if we could review the current guidance um, so as you can see there a quarter of all accidents uh, sorry quarter of all fatal incidents are from overturns now it can be from a number of reasons but you know without stating the obvious certain incidents are no doubt going to be from poor ground uh, driving near slopes or so coming off nice ground flat ground onto, onto sloping ground potentially elevated wheels dropping off uh, slab concrete, um, but undoubtedly it'll also be from ground and underground services which have given way uh, and you know, under the point of contact with that MUP. There may of course be other scenarios which have overturned the MUP and, and people you know, often don't realise you know, overloading, you know, not, that can certainly cause an overturn, but also snagging. Uh, a trapped, uh, snagging and freeing a trapped mute. So in other words, I've caught the basket on something and I'm trying to you know, free the machine and then suddenly I free the machine, but it's like uh, a catapult. It pings me out of the actual, uh, pings me over effectively. So uh, yeah, looking at the incident, you can see there we've got um, not far behind, you know, around about the 20% entrapment and then ele electrocution. Now I did a, a separate webinar a good few months ago on secondary guarding. So you can quite welcome to go and have a look on our website for that um, recording and, and, and get a little bit more information on what devices are out there to prevent entrapment. 
so hopefully that gives you a bit of information um it's certainly not good news but you know when you take into account these you know there's, there's probably around about a million moops in the world you know if you look at that ratio it, it's probably very low in comparable to looking at some other types of access for working at height but but still we've obviously got incidents there where people haven't gone home to their families so um looking at the fatalities by mute type um and i wouldn't necessarily say this surprised me or not but you know it didn't surprise me to see that the the largest incidents there from overturn were in the mobile category um so for those machines which are what we class as being as free on wheels they will travel at height so as you can see um those types which they can travel in the elevated um position um so starting off in one position maybe lowered elevating to a point and then traveling along a route which I may add should have been walked and surveyed uh, by the operator prior to using the MUP. They get to another location, but unfortunately uh, on overturning on the way uh, in the MUP. So in 3B type machines, so that's a mobile boom, so that'd be articulated and telescopic. We've got 13 and 3A, 12 in total. So a total of 25 fatalities occurred from overturning on the mobile type MUPs um, in, the, in, the, in that time frame. And then we have a further eight uh, on a static boom so a truck mount a track mount uh, a spider type machine um, occurred in the same time frame now what i don't have is the makes and the models of mupes that these occurred on um, and i'm sure chris probably has a little bit more information than me um, but any information that's given to ipath is sanitized so we as members don't see what potentially you as contractors have all we will know is there's been you know a person fell off a machine a person ran over their own foot so don't ever feel that you're sharing something that you, you wouldn't want to to you know the the, the greater masses to know it's sanitized and chris has uh, ensured that all the way through um so looking at that in itself the overturns it would elude there that um 3a, 3A and 3b type machines offer the greatest uh, potential risk of overturning and obviously we have got um, the one B lagging, not lagging that far behind. So a um, bit of a historical tour. Why, you know, again, why we got here? Obviously, I've, you know, we've seen the fatal data. Not good news. Um, but AFI at the time were in discussions to become a supplier for powered access uh, machines to a principal contractor, who I won't name. Uh, and during these discussions, we were asked if we would supply spreader pads for MUPs. The answer for trucks and tracks was yes, without doubt, you know, our trucks and tracks go out with spreader pads. But then we were asked about vertical type machines or scissors that had jacks. And our answer was at the time was no, emphatically no. Um, and this was because, you know, it's, it's the client, the contractor, the subcontractor's responsibility. But we will supply weight to the machine and point loads, which is our responsibility under Section 6. The principal contractors then specified and showed me photographic evidence of a range of mobile vertical machines which have been supplied on site um, and these other higher companies have supplied them with mats the irony is that some of the machines when we looked at some of the machines were actually ours um, and they were being used on their site um, without mats so i kind of question their consistency to which you got a little bit shirty about but that's a different story so further discussions then found that from looking at other other incidents some of the rental companies were supplying pads with the higher machines for 3A type machines. So sitting down with, with the gentleman, a very nice gentleman, what risks? I saw examples of machines, you know, sat on concrete that were 10 inches thick to two type, you know, type two aggregate. You know, 10 inches concrete, do I really need a mat, you know, an outrig of mat? Do I, you know, unless I'm gonna damage the wearing cost, then the answer is probably no, um, given that they're only going, you know, they're not putting a massive amount inside the machine. I really love the picture on the on the right there, right? Because this one, that particular picture, unfortunately, as you can see, the state of the platform, and unfortunately, it does look a bit pixelated there. But that's the best image I can get. That ended up in a fatality. And that was a tree trimming incident up in the north. Um, you know, unfortunately, people injured um, and, and killed in that one. This picture, cracking that. You know, a bit of scaffold board, probably something that you've you may well have seen on your site before. Um, you know, has, has he been informed about this? Has he been told that he's got to do it? The irony is, on looking at that, is the blocks and bricks that's underneath there are not point loading. They're point loading up because they're stabbing into the actual piece of material. So effectively, you could have damage from from underneath because there's no, um, you know, there's no bearing course underneath there. So in other words, you know, we haven't put anything in there to make it so it's a flat flat surface. So if you take 
the example that I mentioned earlier, the liability side of things, who takes that on? Um, and from, from our initial discussions with this principal contractor, they actually thought that they, they could supply or we could supply them with one type of mat which would supply all ground conditions. So, uh, you know, I really, really sort of question their perception of, of what this map will do. So not only was the principal contract con con contractor confused around MUPs, their ground conditions, but also the responsibility. You know, which type of machines do require spreader pads? Um, and then, of course, then, adopt the old bombshell. What about wheeled machines? The very fact that the mobile vertical machine or the mobile boom, and I will stress that, has to drive to the location, tells me that somewhat they're lacking on their understanding of ground conditions at the time. The MUP still got to be in a position to um, elevate. It therefore stands to reason that the ground that the MUP travels and elevates on has to be capable of withstanding the weight of it, regardless of whether it does need a spreader pad or not. Now, on this picture there on the screen, clearly that's not a spreader pad. That's a homemade type um, you know, scaff board that's been cut down, and that's you know, clearly going to be, um, you know, set up. He's still got to get him. He's still got to drive to the position, um, and the, you know, the, as you can see, the ground is is quite uh, quite on the rough side. So the current guidance out there, IPAF, um, their guidance document says assessment of ground conditions. It is strongly recommended that suitable spreader plates should always be used under the outrigger feet, irrespective of the apparent ground conditions. And whereas BS 8460, which is this, the safe, uh, the code of practice for the safe use of MUPs, it says spreader pads are often required when outriggers are placed on unmade ground soil surfaces and where underground voids may be present that cause a sinking, cause the surface to collapse under the outrigger. So somewhat contradictory there. You've got one that's saying always and one that says often, um, and they're two pieces of guidance that are available in the UK. Well, I will say there is that 8460, um, Outriggers. It mentions outriggers, but it doesn't mention anything about jacks, and it doesn't mention anything about stabilizers. And you'll see that a little bit later on. So, yeah, we're talking about overturns. Let's not forget, mupes are stable pieces of equipment. Okay, incidents, and as we know, come from incorrect setup and misuse, poor ground assessment, probably the primary cause, poor spreader plate uh, selection, and the incorrect position of the outrigger, um, and that sources from vertical. And you can see there a couple of incidents there. So, a few, few uh, examples of it. And it's just to kind of give you, there is a very good document out there. It is somewhat long. Um, the Strategic Foreign Plant Safety Group um, put together a document on ground conditions. Um, so it is somewhat long, but they did do a shortened version of it. So what do we know about ground? Right. So simply, this is material that supports the MUP. It can be any type of ground. Ground assessment, ground information assessment, determination of the reliability and sufficiency of ground information in relation to the task to be undertaken and the mute being considered. So this is going to include, if required, inspection of the site for additional data and investigation. Ground assessment, this is the process of assessment of the suitability of a specific area of ground to support the specific mute. This may include th such things like vertical loads, such as weight, horizontal loads, such as wind or slewing, and the resulting forces of ground pressure under tracks or point loads from outriggers, stabilizers, or jack pads. Okay, and a ground in investigation, as you can see there, would be some type of engineering process and technique which is used to obtain technical information that may be required to determine ground bearing capacity and validate the suitability of the underlying ground. So we're talking somebody coming in there and actually taking a, a you know full soil sample as you would see there. So, okay, a little bit of a survey time then. Okay, so what I'm going to now show you is three machines. And what I want you, what I would like, or what I would ask you to do is try and uh, or, or select which device you think is being used to support the actual MUP at the time. So if you can just, now, I can see on my screen, you probably can't see it on yours, I wouldn't have thought, but um, if you can just now um, give you a sort of 30 seconds to tell me which one that you think is supporting that. You've got 20 seconds, 10 seconds left. OK. 
Okay, 70% of you have voted. Come on, all of you, please. Click the button, unless you're all off making cups of tea. Okay, I'll close that poll now. All right, thank you very much. Okay, same again here, please. So can you tell me that? So mobile vertical machine. And see a bit of an inspection work underneath there. Set up. It's a good stock picture that, and you know, I won't uh, knock my friends at Genie. Um, but you know, if you look at the picture, there's nothing under them uh, devices, is there? Okay, five more seconds. Okay, thank you. And last but not least, sorry, it all seems to go back on itself for some reason. I don't know why. Okay, and if you'd just be so kind as to do the same thing there for me, please. Okay, 10 seconds, 87% 80 of you have voted. All right, so common machine you see, probably one of the more complex type of machines that's probably out there as well. All right, five seconds. Okay, and I'll stop that there. Right, great. All right, super. So what you can see um, with them three machines is to all intents and purposes, they are different devices, um, either supporting or stabilizing the machine. You can see the bottom picture there, you know, technically is lifted off the ground. You can see the um, this machine. You can see this machine, all right, technically can still be on the ground, but may have leveled its, its frame out. And you can see this machine has got its devices down, and I've been careful so I don't spoil anything. All right, which is basically stabilizing the machine and such. Okay, so, okay, so, and this is where it gets a little bit interesting. EN280, all right, is a design standard for MUPS. Um, and the irony is, outriggers under EN280, there is no that definition. Now, I've always known them as outriggers, and this is what always makes me a little bit smile. Jack legs, the picture on the, on the screen there, I've been with mutes, you know, 18, 19 years. To me, that is a jack leg. However, EN280, no definition. Stabilizer, however, under EN280, and this is the new standard, 2013, um, this has stabilizer defined, but it relates to various stabili stability systems, and of course, the use varies. So we're gonna look at that very, very quickly in a second. Now, don't forget, you get all this later on, so you don't have to make huge amounts of notes. But as you can see there, um, Ian, outrigger, jack leg, um, and um, I'm just moving something, and stabilizer. You can see over, you know, on EN280 2013, you can see down the very bottom there, devices and systems used to stabilize mutes by, by supporting and or leveling the compute mute or the extending structure. So for example, jacks, suspension locking devices, or extending axles. So suspension locking device, you might, different word, but it's an oscillating axle as such. Now, I color coded some things over on the right hand side. ANSI 9, A92, uh, 0.5 and 0.6. You can see outrigger is defined. Devices that increase the stability of the aerial platform and that are, and that are capable of lifting and leveling the aerial platform. But now look at stabilizer. Devices that increase the stability of the aerial platform and this is anti these standards, but are not capable of lifting or leveling the aerial platform. So co completely contradictory. Well, say what I'm saying is one saying you can't lift, you're not capable of lifting it, but one is saying that you can. I'm not too worried about the design and uh, and and the 8460 at this moment. But if you look at um, if you look at 8460, you can see there you've got the outrigger and you've got the stabilizer. 
So EN280 is what machines are designed, okay? But 8460 is our safe use document, okay, that's out there, which effectively is actually due for a, a review shortly. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Let's go back. And yet we see this in operator's manuals, yeah. If you look at that, okay, our friends at, um, at Genie there, outrigger housing if equipped with outriggers. Skyjack, independent of fully automatic self-leveling outriggers. Okay, so I look through um, operator's manuals, excuse me. I look through operator's manuals, which in this case are both North American, would show that instructions identifies terminology which doesn't actually meet our EN280. And this is really why I've highlighted this here now. So you can see the 8460, um, we have outriggers and stabilizers, um, but then we have these ANSI standards, which is the, uh, the American standards, and we can see where they are actually differ from ours. So when we take our friends from, from you know, from North America who have you know, design, designed some fantastic equipment, their operator's manuals are featuring in this word outrigger all the time. Okay, and what we might be thinking of something is, is a jack leg. Also as well, I'm a big believer, um, we do need some consistency um, in operating manuals, you know, and this is just one example, you know, so you can see jack plate, supporting plate, but we're getting, you know, manuals still referencing things like pounds per centimetre squared, kilograms per centimetre squared, decanewtons, we're getting items such as force area, surface pressure, gross weight, um, but that's great for one manual, you go to another operator's manual, and you might find that they are completely different. So, you know, we're trying to help people and trying to, you know, support and educate people here. So, just to put it into a bit of context, you know, a, a 2,000 kilogram elephant has a force of between 50 and 100 pounds per square inch PSI on the floor, whereas a 65 kilogram woman in high heels has a force of about 2,000 PSI. So the lady in their high heels has 20 times the greater force than the elephant. So such force, certainly has the ability to damage any floor unless we of course spread the load accordingly. I'm not saying that we're going to put elephants in stilettos may I add. So some operators manuals do go a little bit further in terms of giving you an example of, of what what this force does actually mean and you can see there the local concentrated pressure is a measure of how hard the mute tire tread presses on the area in direct contact with the floor. The floor can obviously be soil, earth, ground, concrete, tiles, carpets, wood, you name it. But it must be more, it must be able to withstand more than the indicated values. So in this area here, you can see the footprint area is the actual tire contact area, the direct tire contract area. So your local concentrated pressure will be your maximum wheel load, in this case, I don't know, six, six ton, it's a boom type machine, divided by your footprint area. So when you look at a tire looking bearing down on the ground, that's an overhead shot really and truthfully, provided the tyres at the right pressure, um, and not forgiven of course, tyres can be solid, foam filled or, or, um, or, or, or pneumatically filled, that is nine times out of ten, the, uh, the average tyre contact area uh, on the ground. So hence you can see, maybe an out, uh, you know, maybe a jack pad or something would give you an indication there of, um, of, of greater areas. So in contrast, what I then also did was a vertical, type machine um, because they often refer to the local concentrated pressure okay and also the overall uniform pressure now this is a measure of the average load that the mupe imparts on the whole surface which is projected directly underneath it so the structure of the operating surface clearly must be able to withstand more than whatever value is being put on there so in this situation you've got the base area which equals the length times the width okay and you've got the Weight of the aerial platform plus its capacity, so in this situation, 227 kilograms, divided by its base area. But again, if we look at the the uh, the, the, the mute from the overhead perspective, you're going to have your overhead, um, your, your width and your length. But you've also got your tyre indications there, as you can see them. So hopefully that gives you just a little bit of an information as to how you know how they get and sometimes arise at some of these figures, and you're thinking, how you know, Craig, how the hell is it that actually that heavy? So. We're now going to look at assessing some of the risks, and this is obviously the, the ground condition elements of these sorts of things. So, um, looking at um, unfortunate situation there, um, you can see there obviously he's, uh, he's having a bad day at the office. But we need to obviously risk uh, management, um, uh, risk manage the ground. 
So you know, clearly a risk assessment is just a, a process of identifying the hazards. It's a systematic process. We're going to evaluate the potential risks. We're going to identify you know, potential nece necessary measures you know, required to eliminate or reduce those to an acceptable level. So, you know, a few few ideas, you know, identify the hazards. What hazards? Well, what's the ground? Is there any voids? You know, as excavations, backfill, has it been compacted? Is there any sloping ground, any soft ground? Concrete, is the concrete, how thick is the concrete? Is it, what's the condition of the concrete? These are all things that you have to consider and think about. Mezzanine floors, what's the point load on them? And then we have to eliminate the hazards where possible. So, you know, avoid if we can. You know, if we can't, we need to then strengthen, support, and potentially reduce loads. We can sometimes look at other types of machines that have less point loads on them. We then need to evaluate the remaining hazards that's there. We know what risk is there left. It is useful, you know, but to be aware of, you know, and we evaluate the remaining hazards. You know, who can be harmed? What's the consequence of that harm? You know, potential number of casualties. Will the machine, you know, tip over? Will it land on a building? Will it land on an escalator? Will it land, you know, on a, on a walkway that's frequented by pedestrians? You know, what potential damage? You know, nature of the, the injuries? Well, you know, when it comes down, it's not going to come down like a feather. It's going to come down like a, you know, a ton of bricks. So they're going to be severe. And, and clearly, you also need to take into account complexity of any clear up um, of, of, uh, of it. Uh, and how can we reduce the loads even further? Then we need to look at, you know, control measures input. Um, so, you know, what other control measures could we use? Could we use trackway? Could we have proprietary systems, timber mats, you know, outrigger pads, etc.? And then we need to identify control measures that appear to be suitable. You know, they should be assessed to ensure that they are adequate, which would include the checking of what that one control measure will not conflict with others. You know, or does it introduce a fresh hazard? You know, we, we supply them with trackway or we start supply them with a pad and, you know, we haven't educated the guys and the girls that, that are using the equipment, what they need to do with it. You know, and then six, you know, develop the methods being used. You know, we then need to sort of, you know, have an identify our hazards, worked out our control measures um, to carry out the task. The information then we need to be put into a, into a plan. Uh, and especially for usual or non-routine tasks, this could include some type of consultation uh, for those who are undertaking or may be affected by the task. Any limitations, contingency measures and emergency procedures. And once the plan has been developed, it should be recorded in a method statement and then planning, um, making sure people understand, um, you know, and then looking at, you know, difference between, um, you know, when the plan gets going and, and any potential incidents that occur. So reviewing before we start. So, but what about wheels? And when I look at wheels, um, a little short film here, um, and hopefully this will play easily. So you can see the mute going on there. Machine probably weighs about 13 ton or so. Um, and it's a, tip, it's a typical sort of, uh, you know, everyday piece of material that we would see. And yet given this, you know, it's just driven onto material. Um, now let's imagine now, you know, he's lowered, you know, and he gets away with it. But now let's imagine now he's elevated, you know, and he's 60 foot in the air, rotated, and he suddenly drive over, drives over this material. So the forces that are on that wheel at that time could be potentially huge. And the chances are now we would have punched straight through that, um, you know, straight through that service inspection, that manual cover. Um, so I often get people saying, well, no, we'll, we'll put a bit of plywood down. That'll do the job. That'll spread the load. I've seen my mate do it. Um, and, you know, we, we think, oh, is that is actually going to work? Um, you know, and, uh, you know, the last thing, there's, there's going to be a substantial amount of cost, but this cost on this particular incident could be life. So I think you get the idea there that that's not actually going to do much good neither.
And then just to give you another example, our friend the scaffold board often gets a, you know, a mention and a, and a chance to show what it's capable of. Okay, so you get the idea there. Yep. Let's go back to that. I have to stop it. Okay. So, um, within the Strategic Forum Plant Safety Group, there is a very uh, useful, simple outline of the ground assessment process. And you can see there that defining the task to be carried out, so you've got works to be carried out at 40 foot adjacent to you know, car park, whatever. And you can see there's parallel activities there which includes you obtaining information about the ground, ensuring that the ground information is adequate. We then, of course, then have to select the plant, um, in this case a MUP for the task, and then we obtain information on the loads and the forces imposed on the ground by that MUP. We then determine if the ground is suitable, if necessary, select and, you know, and use design measures to improve the ground or the reduced, uh, you know, reduce the loads, and then inform the, the right people of the design parameters and, and, and what they should do. That, although it's not the greatest uh, copy there, again, download the Strategic Forum Plant Safety Group document from ground conditions off um, the CPA website, um, or contact me afterwards and we can always get this sent over to you. It's, it's a lot easier to read. So I often think now, you know, is it any wonder that our, uh, you know, customers are confused? I think industry has done a very, very great job in getting pertinent messages out there. Um, but ground is and always going to be the responsibility of the client, the contractor. Um, and fortunately, terms and conditions of hire specify that they are responsible for the ground. So, you know, forgive the pun, but hire companies supplying spreader mats could be uh, dodgy ground um, because one pad isn't going to fit every, every potential scenario. Um, if I refer back to the incident that I had originally, they did say, you know, can you supply us three types of mats? for different areas um, and it was just it was getting a bit worse um, on that so un under under the cpa terms and conditions the hire is deemed to have knowledge of the site of the property or land where the plant is be delivered uh, and the hire warrants that the condition of the site or place of delivery of the plant is suitable if the, in the opinion of the hirer the ground is soft or unsuitable the for the plant to work on travel on be transported of on be erected or dismantled on without timbers or equivalent support. The hirer shall supply and lay suitable timbers, we still talk about wood, or equivalent support in a suitable position for the plant to travel on, work on, be transported on, erected or dismantled on. So terms and conditions, you know, very, very important that you understand what you're signing up to. So spreader pads, who's responsible for supplying them? Um, there, there's a number of proprietary systems out there, you know, made from various materials now, plastic, wood, nylon, polythene, polypropylene, you know, they're going to be ranged, you're going to be supplied in a range of sizes from, you know, 800 mil to, to 1500 millimeters and diameters from 400 mil to 1200 millimeters. Thicknesses wise, generally speaking, up to about 100 mil and these pads in the, these type tend to be limited in, in this area and size because you know ultimately we can only manually handle such a, such a large piece so you know you're not going to find that you know if you see some of the big crane boys you'll see some some of them pads the size of a you know size of you know 20 feet they're lifted into place by the crane so as these pads also tend to have a smooth surface care's got to be taken to ensure that outrigger feet potentially do not slip off the pad in wet or icy conditions um, we also find that some pads are manufactured with a recess, then this allows the location of the outrigger foot. So where pads are placed onto a surface is, like I showed you earlier, that crushed concrete or, or other large granular material. We've sometimes got to put a binding layer underneath that to avoid what we call that negative point loading and, and damage the pad. I appreciate they weren't using a pad, they were using a piece of timber, but you know, basically the, the, the force is still going down, you're just going to crush it from the underside. Um, so if you look at the picture there now, you know, is a suitable storage on the vehicle. You find that most truck mounts and, and track mounts do have a storage uh, facility for these. And, you know, technically track mounts sometimes are either in the basket or they're attached to the foot. Um, is inspection included in the pre-use check? So we've selected the, you know, we've you know, made sure the guys have selected this. We checked the MUP out 
but who's going to check out the um, you know the actual pad themselves? And we need to be aware of things like you know by, you know manual handling issues. You know some of these are quite can be quite heavy, um, and we have enough of these issues in terms of health problems going forward. Uh, and of course, we need to make sure that we uh, we you know we're buying from a proved reputable supplier. You know obviously you you push and you punch the pad into the ground. Often we you know I've seen pads that will never be recovered because they've been buried. So um, the original Ready Reckoner calculator was designed for, but also limited to, the vehicle mount's gross weight. Um, and at the time, it was um, this was from the original working group that I sat on, and it's done industry well from now. Uh, I'm not sure how many times it's been viewed and used, but I'd like to think that it's prevented some serious incidents over the years. Um, you basically select the drop-down box on the left-hand side, whatever size machine you are, 3.5, 7.5, 12, 18, 26, and 32 tons. Um, and then basically it would give you your weights and the size of your pad that you need. And, and obviously a, you know, a big red thing saying, look, you can't get less than this, then you need to sort of you know, seek further advice. But I'm pleased to say now that, that we've now, with this new working group, we've now got a new type of outrigger pad calculator coming out. Not sure that's a great picture on there but you know it looks uh, it looks okay on my screen but you can see there now it's giving you an indication of the size so you're going to put your load in tons on the left you need to reduce your ground pressure you know to, to this um, you need to put your uh, surface area squared centimeters in and it's going to give you a reference number for your pad it's got a conversion table in there uh, and, and various loads and thicknesses so part of this working group which which I head up um, we've now identified that it's not just static booms and truck mounts, uh, but it's also mobile mubes. And unfortunately, these statistics speak for themselves. So vertical types. So as you can see on the picture there, um, as where spreader pads are identified as part of the risk assessment to reduce ground bearing pressures, but they are not part of the original manufacturer's equipment OEM. These are normally supplied by the higher contractor. So when we but purchase our machines, um, you know, we will be not sold pads that go with a vertical type machine. For the simple fact, your Genie, your Skyjack, your JLG manufacturers, they will not put that liability on themselves to say they've supplied us with an 800 by 800 mil pad because they have absolutely no idea where we or our clients are going to use them. Two photos above, um, you've got a picture there. You know, I could probably stick my neck out and say it's perfectly acceptable that you know, save for damage of the wearing course. You know, clearly I have no indication of how deep or thick that concrete is. So, you know, carrying out a, um, a survey, etc., may identify it's not. We need to do other things. Um, but then we look at the other picture, right? And we've got a picture there um, of a somebody who's chosen a type of pad. I'm not sure. It looks a little bit like plywood. Um, underneath it, you know, a what we would know as a jack leg, but we now know it's actually a stabilizer. Um, and it's not even in the center of the, the pad. Um, um, so for it to be in the center, if you think about it, he would have to drive about another six inches, which may already mean that his, that his wheels on the pad. Um, so yeah, not, not good. So if you look at that, some very good examples there of, of, of good and bad, uh, or potentially bad and bad, you know, your opinions do, do count. Okay, pads or no pads. Um, I do love our manufacturers, bless them. Um, we have two reputable manufacturers there showing their product and its ability, its agility. Um, and you can tell from the length of the downside hydraulic cylinders, which are on show in each of the photos, that these are quite high off the ground. So the picture at the bottom there, you can see there, you can see there at the bottom there that you know that that them wheels are somewhat sort of six to ten inches off the ground um needless to say i have quite a high you know a sinking feeling there you know who did the survey who did the ground assessment you know who obtained information and carried out an investigation i would fear probably in this situation none because it's for marketing it's to show you other product um but unfortunately these posters get put up in walls they get put in brochures and unfortunately you look at that and think is that all right is it not um so looking at that now um you can see there you know god forbid the uh, pad on the yellow and gray machine uh, started to sink um the scissor pack that's elevated there would be uh, over on its side so let's not forget about our wheels okay because this is part of the reason this was brought in um none of these machines can get to their position without driving and yet we focus much more on pads such as stabilizers, 
outriggers and jacks. Uh, some come down, they potentially increase the weight, they sometimes potentially level and stabilize it. And yet we have mupes now that have the potential now in boom type mupes to elevate to 185 feet and drive at that height or 104 feet in vertical type mupes and drive at that height with weights ranging from 20 tons um, and potential wheel loadings of 13,000 kilograms or 13 tons. So two of the photos that I've showed you there, uh, I believe ended up in fatalities to the platform occupants, the one included in the screen there. One, as you can see, was a surface duct collapsing, collapsing and one which maybe isn't so clear uh, from the operator driving at height um, off relatively flat ground and then driving onto sloping ground. Um, a tragic event which could have been avoided. So, um, I've got time to show you this, pit, this uh, video. You can see the boom in the uh, upper part of the actual um, video work in there. You see the buses, the pedestrians, and I talked about side hoardings earlier. Can you see the parked car at the lights just leaving? You can see the scissor lift. You can see the side hoardings on the far side. You can see the wheels now turning. If you look at number 75 at the top, you can just see the operator in the basket. He's just turned his wheels. He does appear to be the wrong way around and boom, and then suddenly he punches into some underground service and down he comes. The dust off the machine, all right, basically um, um, as, as a basket here. And then, of course, the proverbial hits the fan, everybody's running, stopping traffic, etc. So when I look at the picture and the underlying causes of the actual machine, you can see there's on the left hand side is the actual machine and on the right hand side, um, you can see there that it's actually um, punched through a manal cover, which would covered with aggregate. And that picture shows you again very, very closely how close that machine was to a you know pedestrian area. So when we're taking into context of potential issues, you can see that even the um, um, traffic lights seem to have come down. Um, you know they were fined two hundred thousand pound by the HSC, and this was quite some time ago. The operator survived, and that's kind of why I'm allowed to show you it. Um, so, um, mupes under, under a wheel, so if we look at a boom type, it's, it's, it's common that we can find up to 80% of the machine's gross weight uh, under uh, one wheel or potential outrigger. And what we have to remember when we're working with booms is we're working potentially with dynamic movement and scissors. So you can see the weigh bridge there um, is tallied out, and in the bottom there you can see the, um, the weight going round, so he's actually at the opposite end of his um, weigh bridge now, but as he rotates round, the weight's changing, the counterweight's going to the opposite end, and you can see there, as he's coming round, the weight is getting heavier. So this is why sometimes when you see on a, a decal on the side of a boom type machine, it may have, for example, in this machine, 8,000 kilograms. This particular machine's in decanewtons, which is um, it is a French machine, but it may say 8,000 kilograms, and it's got four of them. Now, there's no way the machine weighs 32 ton, 4.8's been 32, but that's its worst case scenario, full load, fully elevated over that exact wheel. Um, so if that, that kind of makes, you know, understand, um, and as, as it, you know, people don't realize when you actually go over the actual, or you elevate up, the wheel force is lower. So you can see he's scrapped, he's scrapped about two ton, 2,000 kilos off his actual, um, off his wheel there. So to summarize then, um, hopefully this makes you more, more aware now of that the ground must be capable of standing the weight of the mupe in the first place, regardless of whatever device has been used to support or extend the supporting base or stabilize or level the mupe. You've got to obtain your point load uh, from your local hire company and ensure it is used to, to an effective use prior to using and operating the machine. Remember, if mupe manufacturers who sell mupes don't sell us as a rental company the mats as part of the original equipment manufacturer's configuration, what's that telling you? They aren't going to take the liability. So, because they understand and, and, and respect that there's not one mat will 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 um, fit all known ground conditions. Um, so, in terms of that, you've got to be very much um, mindful that there could be a number of um, um, potential, um, you know, mats that need to be available.
Okay, so we've looked at responsibilities, um, clearly defined and that guidance is available. We've looked at some fatal data showing the greatest number of incidents are with mobile type MUPs. We looked at current guidance and how it's been misinterpreted and looked at the AN280 and 8460 standards. We've looked at how pressure is exerted and ways to ascertain um, the information and some risks and hazards. The spread the load campaign, it'll still remain, I believe, as the spread the load campaign. I take this to the, um, the UK Country Council tomorrow to kind of let, you know, inform them as to uh, how things are going. Um, and that, you know, there is a new Ready Reckoner coming, new version and new guidance that's going to be um, provided out to the, um, the, the working group. So kind of, um, you know, there is, a, there is a lot of information there. Okay, so if you've got any questions or um, that you may have, um, please feel free that you can you can type them in the uh, in the box there. I'll be more than happy to um, you know answer any questions. If you don't have any questions, then um, you know please um, you know do feel you, you, my email address is available at the end of the actual presentation. If you don't feel like you want to um, put anything on here, um, then um, you know I can always look at these at a later date. So I've got a question in here. Can we can in the UK we force manufacturers to give higher loads in understandable format? Um, I completely uh, and I know there there are um, manufacturers listening to this. They've certainly registered. Um, I completely agree with you. I think um, in terms of the information that they give, um, and I highlighted it earlier, we've got decanewtons, we've got pounds, we've got kilograms. Um, we've got various forces that they use. We've got centimeters squared. We've got cubed. So I think, yeah, I agree. And this is certainly on one of my um, um, you know, challenges to try and get this across to it. The unfortunate side of things is it, you know, it, it's it's getting with the uh, getting with the manufacturers and, just, and getting them to understand that um, um, these things are actually needed. Um, so yeah, so I, I certainly will, um, you know, be taking that forward. Um, so how would you all right, let's have a look. How would you classify an incident where a mute gets stuck on a structure, i.e. the basket being wedged on a structural steel? So that particular that, that incident, that's nothing um, that it, well, it's not a common occurrence as, as such that we hear. Um, but it is one of the kind of occurrences where we have a machine that's what's known as a snagged platform. In terms of classifying it, um, I'm not sure if you're asking about um, you know reporting this to the HSC. Um, you know, clearly, if it's stuck on a piece of uh, of steelwork uh, and being wedged, um, then in, unfortunately, you know, this has happened before where people have they have attempted to try and free the the basket, um, and in doing so, have caused you know uh, quite a quite an amount of bounce or or flex in the boom, uh, and unfortunately, when it um, you know when when it does go. Um, and, and let itself free, then um, unfortunately it goes with a bounce, um, and that in the past has caused um, fatalities. Um, similarly, can we ensure details from principal contractors, i.e., um, to then ascertain requirements? Not sure what you're asking there for incident near miss. I mean, yeah, we would always like to know when you've had incidents from from platforms where they've got struck or where they've got snagged or you know what was the um, the issues surrounding that because you know they are busy operators when they're up there in the air. Um, but equally, at the end of the day, we we would love to know. And this again, remember anything that you report to the IPAF incident accident database is sanitised. So I wouldn't know if Joe Bloggs contractors contractors. Um, you know, tipped a machine up. It wouldn't tell me that. It'll just say it'd been an overturn. Um, so your data is completely sanitised um, for because it might be it might be one of our guys. It might be one of our rental guys that have you know dropped a machine off the side of the truck. Um, you know these things are reported. Most un people understand kilograms and tons. Surely this for format would be best to uh, to. to um, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and I, I you know. I, Kilograms and tons, you know, it is for me. Uh, unfortunately, um, our our friends in Europe sometimes um, they like decanewtons, uh, tenth of a newton, a newton. What's a newton? And it's all, you know, looking at this. 
from the video of the way bridge will all manufacturers take from this webinar that we need max weights published on actual plant some do and some don't uh, I would hope so um, the good thing is um, all your questions do come to me on a and I'm looking on a very small screen actually on this um, uh, webinar software um, the part where I see the questions so forgive me but all the questions come and these are the things that I can take back to the strategic forum plant safety group um, because I do believe um, that you know some of these questions are you know this is the real question so from the video of the Waybridge, all our manufacturers take this webinar that we need maximum weights published on actual points on plant. Some do, some don't. Um, are machines only tipping with the boom extended? No, unfortunately they're not. No, some do unfortunately go um, you know with with the machine in the in the stow position and lowered. Unfortunately, you know we could overload them, um, but there are a greater greater amount of machines that will will um, will tip over with the boom extended. Okay, um, that's the uh, end of the webinar. Do feel free that if you want to, um, um, you know, send questions to me afterwards. Um, I can see there's some more questions come. I will endeavour to answer your questions. Incidentally, by the way, obviously your poll, 80% um, of you thought that were they were outriggers. Um, but if you look under EN280, 86% um, of you thought they were outriggers. 10% of you thought they were stabilisers. And 5% of you thought they were jack legs. By definition, um, and this is the one that surprised me when I started digging into it, is I would say the 86% were outriggers for the um, for the track mount. Um, EN280 calls it and classes it as a stabilizer. Um, the um, van mount um, with the um, with the devices, stabilizer, and even the scissor lift um, from our friends at Genie is a stabilizer. So. Uh, there's a bit of work to do in terms of um, getting some information out to the manufacturers and I certainly think we need consistency um, across manufacturers um, there's some very good people on them committees now and I think they are starting to get the message so hopefully um, hopefully you'll um, um, you'll get some better information going forward all right as I say there's my email address if you've got any questions or if you want to send us anything please do send us your feedback on what you thought of the webinar hope it's been useful and informative um, and um, you know look forward to the next one if you've got any thoughts or ideas on the next one then please feel free to email me thank you very much have a great day bye